dial, also on your digital radio and on 3cr.org.au. Support your local community radio that supports you with local politics, local music, local poetry, local love. This love is not for sale. So the Green Senator, Rachel Seward, has been really vocal on this since it was first rolled out in 2016. She's from Western Australia, which the Goldfields is one of the first places they rolled out this cashless welfare card. And, you know, one of the key criticisms is that, you know, even if you do stop people spending money on local and various things, if you don't set up any wraparound services to support these issues like drug and alcohol counselling, rehab centres, you know, it, it's totally ineffective. And I think it's, you know, uh, we're going to have Amanda on from the Say No 7, you know, a Facebook activist group. And something they've highlighted is the, the places where the cashless welfare card has been rolled out, so Doona in South, 35,000 people now on the, on the trial, but all the things they've asked for, professional rehab unit, you know, youth centres, drug and alcohol counsellors, none of them have been delivered. Well, I think, you know, and like many things in Australia, that um, Aboriginal people are usually used as guinea pigs for the government's kind of trials of trying to crack down on um, people, you know, enjoying any kind of liberties. And I remember... Um, as part of the Melbourne Anti-Intervention Collective and um, group we started in 2007, that, you know, the basics card uh, was really a part of, you know, became a really key focus of that campaign, actually, um, from, I guess, you know, from around 12 months afterwards, because it, it, it again, was used in trial in, in those areas there. And I think on top of the fact of, um, you know, having your money quarantine on a card, especially in, in um, you know, Aboriginal communities like that, so much of the services are so expensive as well that it means that um, you can't go to another service that you might have to get that thing cheaper because the, the supermarkets and those places are charging, you know, fifty dollars for a loaf of bread or whatever. You know, they're actually quite obscene the amounts. And so it, it is going to hit those communities, and it already has been for you know, twelve years now. It's a classic example of um, what the government has been doing the entire time since colonisation, which is not listening to Aboriginal people and not listening to their requests for what they actually need in their communities, um, which is shameful yeah. and now being rolled out further. It's, it's interesting, the Cape York and NT, where there's 23,000 people on what was the basics card, now being moved to this Indu card, which is a private company. Uh, 80% of those 23,000 people are Indigenous, and the main things they've been asking for during what little consultation process there has been has been autonomy and respect mm. alongside services part of the funding. And obviously this has not been this delivered. I mean, clearly it's highly paternalistic, um, it's totally misplaced, it's restrictive, it's, it's an infringement on civil liberties, and it was a, it's an openly racist policy, which now it seems like the government is trying to make an openly classist policy where anybody who needs any form of government support um, is going to be treated like they cannot manage their own affairs. I actually um, you know, found this audio of David Lionhouse, who's a, you know, just a despicable human being, in my opinion. That's my opinion, I should say. Uh, um, I, think it's, uh, I think other people have that opinion. Well. Yeah, I think uh, I'm sure. I mean, do you? <laughs> do you have that opinion? I've never met the man, um, <laughs> but I've never heard anything positive about him. In your immediate experience? No, me well, either. I don't know. I've never heard anything. <laughs> <laughs> or read, or seen, or yeah. Uh, anyway, I just thought it'd be worth playing just a little clip of David here to get an insight into the way that, the, you know, he's a conservative mouthpiece and the way that these narratives are shaped around people who need the support of the community that they live in. The bill removes legislative limits on the delivery of welfare through a card instead of cash. A proportion of the welfare of the card, typically 80%, cannot be used to directly pay for alcohol, gambling or illegal drugs. The Liberal Democrats support this bill. Some people find this position confusing. After all, the Liberal Democrats support you doing what you want with your money. The point is, welfare is not your money. It's charity. It's the taxpayers' money. And taxpayers can set whatever conditions they like on the use of that money. If those offered other people's money don't like the conditions, no one is forcing them to take the money. So, this idea here, first of all, that no one is forcing people to take the money just shows a complete lack of understanding of what the social safety net is and what welfare is. If you're a full-time carer or you're living with a disability, this is 
you know, if you're chronically unemployed because of the 15 people per one available job, it's not a choice to take welfare, it's a necessity. And this other idea that taxpayers can somehow determine how their money is spent, I would like to determine how much of my money goes towards the military industrial complex, how many goes towards building coal mines. Yeah, trying to make Australia one of the biggest exporters of weapons in the world. It's just blatant lies that, 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 that there is, in so many other facets, there is any control by people paying taxes, you know, huge taxes that government collect and then spend on things that I fundamentally don't agree with. So this insane idea that we can somehow set caveats on the money that people use to survive, to send their kids to school, to, you know, to buy medical supplies, to pay for rent, you know, that we can, we, we can have any say in how that money is spent, I think it's just gross. I think if we want to, I mean, people joke about that, um, have a go, get a go from Morrison. Um, but there's actually, I think, you know, if you look at some of the writing, the monthly and quarterly essay, um, journalists have been doing. It's going quite deeply into how his um, you know, religious ideology is shaping his language. And it's actually, it's it's not just a saying that's come out of nowhere. It, it really is something that is framed by um, what Morrison thinks is, should be happening. And, you know, what they're saying is, if you don't have a job, if you don't have a house, you're not having a go. And, you know, that's, that's really that they're saying. And so then they're saying, the government's not going to give you anything. And actually in the lead up to the election, Morrison said that uh, we we live the services that we rely on are very clear and that we plan to deliver on these. These are the things that Australians can rely on. Well, isn't welfare one of those things that Australians want to rely on? Mm. I think that, you know, while he didn't promise much, this is, you know, one statement that was from a quarterly essay that came out just after the election that Morrison did promise and I think it's clear that that's something that they're trying to eradicate. Yeah. Well, their own numbers say they spent six point eight billion less social services in the 17-18 fiscal year. Now we probably should get our interview guest, Amanda, from the Scene 07 on the line, but I thought uh, while we get on the line we could hear a classic track from the California punk band The Dills. Uh, this is their 1977 track, Class War. I think it's on the Deals play Class War and you're on 3CR listening to Uprise Radio and we're joined by Amanda from the Say No 7. Thanks for joining us, Amanda. Are you there, Amanda? Can you hear us, Amanda? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for Sorry joining us. That. No, not your fault. Um, so you guys have been opposing the cashless debit card since the first trials. Can you tell us about um, how the card initially targeted Aboriginal communities and what impact it's had? Yeah. Okay, it kind of started in uh, Seduna, as most, most people know by now. Um, but income management itself was first introduced way before then in the Northern Territory in 2007 uh, and become part of the enter response, the Northern Territory Emergency Response. So income management itself was already amongst the communities a long time before then. But in 2015, it rolled out in Seduna, the Inju card specifically, and um, it really was a steamroll for the whole community. Um, I've got the actual words from the community themselves because I didn't want to speak for anybody. Um, And what they were told was that it wouldn't be a blanket approach. Um, It was only supposed to be targeted to people who were abusing alcohol and um, using drugs. And, um, you know, it would only be for one year. And uh, when it came in, it actually came right through and with all payments, all ages, and targeted everybody. And um, the signatories to the MOU, which is the Memorandum of Understanding, you know, um, yeah, the, the promises were made to people that, you know, things were going to go a certain way and it just didn't materialise. So the community was left rather stunned. One woman describes it as a bomb in the town, you know, so it's a pretty full-on experience. That sounds and, absolutely uh, devastating. 
Yeah, well, I'm reading it here. Um, they ended the, the understanding with the government in good faith and, um, and were given a lot of misleading information. Basically, what's happening again now is <laughs> happened in 2015. Um, some communities were sort of had information sessions where they were told what was going to happen to them as opposed to being part of the decision-making process. Other communities, um, especially communities close to Port Augusta, weren't even told at all. The first they realised they were going to be put on cards was when they arrived in the mail. So a very huge lack of community consultation and, um, you know, and very quickly, um, many stewards and people withdrew the MOUs, but by then it was too late. Um, they had no... Uh, community consent was no longer considered an issue. The program was put in place and um, and it was extended the very next year by the mayor who in a, in, made a midnight council meeting, decided for everyone it would continue. So nobody had a say in it continuing either. So it was a, a, a real... It wasn't... It was sort of after the suspension of the Racial Act for the end of intervention, um, it was pretty much sort of a slap in the face and underlining that process of removing people's rights without their consent, not giving them the information to help themselves.